welcome to Industry Updates. This session's become a regular fixture on the, the Outs programme and covers a range of different industry updates, new services, um, developments from existing services. And, and this year's no different. We've got quite a broad range of topics that we'll be covering. So in terms of the format, the plan is that we'll just take a question or two after each of the presentations because we've got a lot to get through and then come back for further discussion and questions at the end. So if we don't get to you initially, then please do hold those questions in your mind until the end. So I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, who's Mark Johnson from PLOS. So I was very grateful that you made the trip over from California for this. And Mark's going to be talking about new developments from PLOS on the editorial environment. Thank you, Louise. And let me get set it up here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, this is my first ALPSP meeting, and it's, it's a really great meeting. Who knew? <laughs> so uh, about me. Um, so I'm, I'm with Public Library of Science based in San Francisco, California. We also have an office here in Cambridge. Uh, and uh, I've been at PLOS for a, um, not quite a year. Uh, and uh, before that, I was at Highwire for uh, about nine years, and before that, I was at the Cell Press imprint of Elsevier for about nine years. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I do want to apologize. The program says that this is an overview of peer review systems. Uh, for that, I would encourage you to go to the 9 a.m. session tomorrow on peer review, and uh, my friend Dr. John Inglis, I'm sure, will give a really nice overview of peer review systems during that. So I'm going to focus on the technology side here today. Uh, and so with some acknowledgments, I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to my former colleagues, uh, Adam Hyde and Kristen Rutan at PLUS, uh, Kristen in particular, who had the good sense to hire me at PLUS, uh, and also uh, my current colleagues, John Chidaki and uh, Helen Atkins, who were involved in uh, the creation of this talk. So uh, start off with, to give you an idea of what, what, what PLOS is, uh, PLOS is a not-for-profit publisher and advocacy organization with a mission to accelerate progress in science and medicine by leading a transformation in research communication. So we're more than just open access, and I think that's really important that you understand that for uh, the rest of this talk. Um, but before I proceed much further, I want to ask you some questions. Um, so how many people in the room are publishers? Great, a lot of you. Uh, how many of you are vendors that work with peer review systems or authoring tools? Some of you in the system too. Okay. Um, of the people that raised your hands that you're publishers, how many of you publish more than one journal? And how many of those journals have exactly the same workflow? <laughs> uh huh. Uh, let's see. Of the publishers, how many of you are in love with your manuscript system? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Okay. So some assumptions that this talk is based on. Um, the first assumption is that peer-reviewed journals largely have very similar workflows. A paper comes in, you assign it to an editor, the editor chooses peer reviewers, they write the reviews, there's an editorial decision, and then you, uh, if it's accepted, you publish it. Same kind of basic process. But we all know that, in fact, those workflows vary. Uh, different publishers uh, have different workflows. Publishers that have multiple journals, the workflows vary from journal to journal. And even at the, in a, at the journal level, uh, the workflow may vary depending on the article. So the conclusion I draw is that we need flexible systems to support our editorial workflows. By the way, the black slides are calculated to uh, tweet. So, you know, they're all less than 140 characters. So if you're tweeting along, those are the slides to tweet. <laughs> so what do I mean by we need flexible systems? So most of the, is there, is there a way I need to point this? It, it's, it's working. Just wanted to make sure. Um, so what do I mean by flexible systems? So for the most part, uh, the off-the-shelf peer review products that we use uh, are, are very flexible in their native form, but when they are in, uh, installed for you, there's a considerable amount of hard coding that takes place. They, they work with you to understand your workflow, and then they code to that workflow, which means changing that workflow, being nimble, being agile, is actually 
a little bit difficult to do. Because the workflows are hard-coded, usually by a single vendor, it makes it very difficult to turn this type of workflow into this or into this. And the result is that inflexible manuscript systems slow the advancement of scientific knowledge. If we're busy working around our workflows, we're not publishing the papers as promptly as they could be published. And that's a disservice to our authors and to our readers. So I'm going to advocate today that a flexible card-based manuscript system can help us, can help us be more efficient in how we deal with our workflows, that can save us time, that can save us money, and with all seriousness, that can actually potentially save lives. If we have an important paper on a healthcare crisis, the more time that we prevent that paper from getting out into the marketplace puts health at risk. So it only makes sense that the more efficient that we are, the better we're serving our community. So what do I mean by card-based system? How many of you have used sticky tabs on, on the wall like this? We do this all the time at PLOS. It's very, very common. Uh, in fact, these are some, some PLOS colleagues that are working uh, on a, a brainstorming project. So the sticky tabs go up on a wall, and then you can easily sort the sticky tabs into columns or you know, groupings. And th that concept is really important for uh, for thinking about the new uh, PLOS system that, that we're talking about. But before I show you the PLOS system, I want to show you uh, an example of a card-based workflow tool. Uh, so this is uh, uh, going to come from Trello. Uh, Trello is a free uh, website. How many of you have used Trello? If you haven't, you should check it out. It's really cool. So Trello is a free online tool that allows you to manage those sticky notes, like the, the paper notes that you stick on the wall. You can actually manage those in the cloud with, with Trello. So here's an example of a Trello board. It's a fairly generic editorial workflow uh, represented with Trello. And the cards each represent a discrete task uh, that's part of the editorial process. And the tasks are organized into different columns or stacks, as we call them. So the manuscript comes in, you assign it to a handling editor who does a number of different tasks. Reviewers are assigned, decisions are made, and then uh, if we're going to publish it, we do a number of technical checks around those papers. So fairly common workflow. So if we had a Trello-like card-based modular editorial system, what could we do? This is the, the point where I like to think of uh, the voice from the movie previews. Imagine in a world where editorial systems were infinitely flexible thanks to modular apps or task engines built as cards in an easy to use Trello-like interface. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And because that was a movie speak, I have a little movie here for you. So this is actually kind of illustrating what we mean by the flexible system. So we've created an ingestion process that um, allows you to convert a Microsoft DocX file to HTML. So let's just move that from our technical checks into our submission process. And now that we've got it set up so that we can convert to uh, uh, HTML, let's also move our uh, XML conversion because from HTML into XML, is a fairly straightforward transformation. So now that we've got those at submission, kind of think of it, almost all the technical checks that we've got at the end of the process could be moved forward in our process. So let's take all of those tasks and shift them around in our workflow and put the technical checks at the front end of the process, except for uh, sending the files out for uh, final production we'll still need to move that at the end of the process. So that's the type of flexibility that I'm describing here, of being able to change up your workflow on the fly. Now, in order to do that, each of those individual tasks needs to be sort of a self-contained application. And they need to run on a common platform. That's, let's see, uh, I'm gonna skip that because that's in case my movie didn't work. 
Um, so that's the type of flexible workflow that, that I'm talking about. So we need flexible workflows, and we need those workflows uh, to innovate, to continually improve how we work. Because as we know, each publisher is different, each journal is different, and in fact, each manuscript that comes through the system uh, is, is different. So what could we do if we had a modular, flexible, card-based workflow? If we used HTML instead of PDFs uh, for what you see is editing, not what you see is what you get, but what you see is, uh, which is an important concept. Uh, if we had a system that allowed for both high-tech automation and high-touch collaboration, and was so intuitive that most users could function without having read the manual. So uh, that's what PLOS is working on. Uh, we're calling it Aperta which is Italian for open. Uh, it's a card-based editorial workflow environment for manuscript authoring, submission, and assessment. And by assessment, I mean peer review. Um, so it's, uh, it, it creates a software to manage our peer review system as well. So this is conceptually how Aperta is organized. There's a core platform. Think of it like your phone, your Android or your iPod or um, iPhone. That's the core software that the tasks, the individual um, components or the applications then work in. So within the core, you've got a dashboard that tells you where you are. You've got the manuscript, which is where the action happens. And then for the publisher view, if, if you're an external contributor, if you're an author, a reviewer, or an editor, all you really see is the dashboard and the manuscript. If you're the publisher, then you also have access to a flow. And the flow view contains all of the different applications that are at your disposal. Now this goes back to what I was saying where every manuscript is different, right? Uh, at PLOS, we re have clinical papers and paleontology papers uh, and everything in between. So you wouldn't want to give a paleontology paper the same type of tasks that you would give a clinical medicine paper, right? So there are different specific tasks based on the type of manuscript that you have. Each of those tasks uh, can be stored in your flow manager. And then those tasks can be assigned at the manuscript level as the submissions come in. So that allows you flexibility on a paper by paper level. The core component is that the manuscript is where the action is. Everything is based around the manuscript itself. Uh, and as you work through the manuscript tasks that are uh, uh, displayed alongside the manuscript, uh, as you complete the tasks, those um, tasks are grayed out. So it's pretty easy to see what you've done, what you, oh, sorry, what you've done, what you still need to do. So here's an example of a workflow uh, for a specific paper. The grayed out items are the ones that have been done. Uh, the green items are the still to do. And you can see that you can do tasks at different steps of the process. Since each step, uh, step or um, each task or card is done individually, it means that uh, if, if I'm an author and I'm authoring in this environment, I can invite other individuals from my team to do different tasks. One person can do the competing interest statement. Another person can make sure that all of the author um, uh, institutions are fully documented. And that type of concurrency um, is part of the system. It doesn't have to be linear as you move it through. You can do multiple tasks at the same time. So uh, Aperta is a native HTML environment. Uh, PLOS spent some time so that when people upload a Microsoft Docx file, uh, that is unpacked and converted into HTML. And as you edit within the Aperta environment, you're changing the HTML, which means that when it's time to publish, there's a very quick step from publishing, um, making that uh, HTML to XML transformation and putting it online. Uh, it's a what you see is kind of environment because the editing takes place within the HTML. Any type of change that you make happens in real time uh, and it's, you're, everybody is always looking at the current version. 
It's a nice user experience. Uh, concurrency is what we've just talked about. Uh, and the last comment I'll say is that we've leveraged existing technologies wherever possible. Uh, we've tried to use open source wherever it was available. So my prediction, I'll leave you with this, is that within seven years, uh, all major learned and professional society publishers will be using card-based editorial systems. Now, I'm not saying that you'll all be using Aperta, although hopefully some of you will. Um, but some of you will probably be using Aperta knockoff type systems. Uh, but I think the, the goal for PLOS is to have everybody working with uh, more modular systems that allow for flexibility so that we all can publish our papers as expeditiously as possible. Uh, because that's a benefit to our authors and the, our readers. So with that, I'll ask, are there any questions? Sorry, that was my 15 minutes. <laughs> is, th is this a, an open source project, or is it being made available to the community in some ways? Thanks, David. That's a really good question. Uh, the plan is to make it open source through an MIT license. Um, we don't have a time frame on when that will happen yet, um, but that is the plan. Other questions? Got it. There's a question in the back. Hi. Um, it, it sounds too good to be true. Um, one particular uh, problem I have is you said that it's going to be H is it um, content is or HTML is, something like that. Um, HTML sounds like a great sort of get out of jail card because it's easier to use than XML. But the problem is, the whole point about HTML is that browsers make it easy to view any kind of rubbish that you put in HTML. So my problem is that if you have all your content in HTML, it looks great, but the content, you don't know how good your content is. So it needs to be XML, not HTML. I think it's the, that is the wrong way to go, if I may say so. Sorry to be a bit of a party pooper in this great place. Uh, well, um, I would say, first of all, you're entitled to your opinion. <laughs> I would say, second of all, uh, PLOS has invested a considerable amount of uh, time, resource, and money uh, in creating the conversion processes that actually put the right entities in the right brackets. Um, so that uh, we're talking about fully structured um, entities where the names of the authors are um, structured with the appropriate tags and metadata. Um, I, I cannot underestimate the amount of time that that has taken. Uh, we've worked uh, with Andrea Lau from uh, Delta Think on that transformation process. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I think, pretty amazing process that we have in place. Uh, I didn't demo, uh, I, I didn't do a real live demo, uh, but if you take a docx file, and by the way, a docx is really a compressed um, like zip file. If you actually take a docx word document and change the suffix from docx to um, zip, uh, zip, uh, then you can actually unpack that and see that it's actually a folder with lots of different uh, subfiles as part of that folder. Um, so we've we've worked very carefully so that when you load a Microsoft Word document, that it can be unpacked and then loaded into HTML. One more question? Okay, one more, go ahead. I'm David Thomas with Thomson Reuters. Um, very interesting concept, and um, I guess my question is, when you talk about the flexibility of changing a workflow at the manuscript level, mm -hmm. right, not just on a journal level, at the manuscript level. Correct. Is this gonna mean that the author can change it? or the editor can change it? Or I mean, at what level is the changeability offered? Great. And how do, you, how do you, if for example, I'm an editor, you got two editors working, I mean, I know PLOS model, you've got several editors working on a particular mm -hmm. journal at any one time. Mm -hmm. So you're an editor and you got three colleagues working on a particular paper. And you make a change to the workflow, 
Does that show up for them as well, or is it unique to you? Um, so I'll answer the last part first. Uh, yeah. Any changes that are made, um, whether it's in the document itself, are uh, done in real time, so everybody can see whatever change that's, that's added. Um, the intent is that the editor, um, it, well, it depends on how the publisher wants to set it up. For PLOS, it's the staff that control the process. So mm -hmm. as a manuscript comes through, using the clinical medical example, um, we, we want the minimum tasks associated with each manuscript so that as the manuscript moves through the system, it can move through as expeditiously as possible. Um, if an editor wants to add a task, uh, each card in the system has a communication protocol built into it. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot like instant messaging. Uh, so you as an editor can contact a PLOS staff member and say, I would like to add an extra step to this, in which case the PLOS staff person can go into the flow manager, grab that extra step, and pop it into the workflow for that manuscript. Great, well, thank you very much, appreciate it.